Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining this LinkedIn Live. Thank you to the ones also that will be watching the recording of this event. I am here today with Sami Rashed and Alex Garcia, and we'll get them to know in a moment a bit more. In the meantime, you know, we want to find out a bit more about our audience, right? You know, we have a, a quite a, a multicultural group today in, uh, in the room. So let's see if uh, the audience as well is uh, as multicultural. And uh, let's tell us maybe a bit more about from where you're joining. You see, you have uh, the chat message on uh, the right side of your screen. And uh, if you tell us from where you're connecting, and maybe if you have any specific expectation from this uh, LinkedIn Live, then we will be delighted to find out a bit more about uh, our audience today. So there's still a bit of delay always between the moment that you type the, the information and when the information comes through. But here we are, we start seeing the first, uh, the first. Oh, Andrew from Singapore. Okay, then we have uh, Durkesh from France. All right, hey, wow. We see that we were going to get an international group. Indeed, you know, then we have Dubai. And Sabrina from Sweden, uh, from Switzerland, sorry. Sabrina from Switzerland. Then uh, 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 Miriam, again, Switzerland, uh, Switzerland, Switzerland. But then we have Tunisia. Hello, Neila. And uh, Tina from Sweden. Fantastic. More Dubai. from Singapore. Okay, mm -hmm. amazing. I mean, that's uh, quite uh, a nice uh, geographical, you have already three continents that uh, are joining us today. Hello, Vincian. Good to see you again. And uh, then, you know, fantastic. Then uh, great uh, to see such a uh, uh, a nice audience. Now let's find out a bit more about uh, our two speakers today. Uh, Alex, why don't you go first and quickly introduce yourself? Thank you, Giuseppe. And it's a pleasure to be here today with all of you. Thank you for joining us today. Well, I'm Alejandra Garcia. Please call me Alex. I'm originally from Mexico, as you can see from my accent. And I have five years living in Basel, where I'm the global VP of procurement for DSM. DSM is a company specialized in nutrition, pharma, etc. And I'm responsible for the procurement um, operations within the organization. I have done my career mostly on FMCGs in every continent. Uh, I have worked for every large company you can think of from Unilever, Kraft, Mondelez, uh, Mars, etc. Nowadays, I'm responsible for DSM. And it's a pleasure to share with you what we're doing in DSM to build a strategic partnership and business partnership um, as the procurement organization. And thank you, Giuseppe, for the invitation today. Wow, what an experience. Thank you, Alex. Sammy. Thanks, Giuseppe. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sammy. Um, as the title says, I do strategic advisory and executive coaching. As brief background, I've been working for a little over 30 years. Uh, spent the first 20 give and take in the corporate world, mostly in pharmaceutical. Uh, I was looking after procurement there. And in my last years, I started to look at the topic of how to move beyond procurement. How can the function step up and deliver more? And that got me into some interesting research with some more interesting findings and ultimately uh, uh, it got me on my own where I've been for the last 10 years uh, and really never looking back. Um, I mentioned this because the Beyond Procurement topic has landed essentially on the need to know the people you're working with and it's going to connect directly with the topic that we're going to be exploring today, the next level of business partnering. So happy to be here today. Um, brief background in terms of geography, I've worked in North America for uh, a lot of my career, I've been in Europe for about 20 years, uh, based in Switzerland, and uh, looking forward to today's call. Thanks again, Giuseppe, for organizing. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Then, and, you know, I have to say that uh, uh, when uh, we first uh, talked about this topic, you know, you insisted that procurement should work with, not for the business. And uh, uh, I still have one of your nice slides on this topic. 
that you know maybe convenient also for the people to you know for our audience to find out a bit more on this topic now can you expand a little more on this concept of working uh, with and not for the business yeah, glad to Giuseppe. alex maybe i start and you can you can build on that because that touches you as well um, so Giuseppe, I, th I think you nailed it correctly. This was one of our objectives when we started to look at the business partnering function. And one of the things that I noticed early on is that the best talent in the function typically describe themselves as business leaders that happen to work in procurement and not as procurement people who work in a company. Uh, and Alex was certainly one of those. This is usually part of your introductions as well. So that, that resonated and that's, you know, that's the right mindset. And, um, if you look at those that succeed, they tend to work with their stakeholders to deliver a great outcomes to customers. They don't work for their internal stakeholders to, de you know, to deliver a high service level. And, and you know, understanding that if you're in a support function, you can either be aligned to the business or you can be a service provider. In my humble opinion, there's more value to be derived by working with them to get more in terms of you know, addressing the, the changing customer needs. So it resonated well and it kind of caught on. And what we tried to do with the slide that you're showing is actually defining a little bit more in contrast what it is and what it's not. So we spent some time to identify what does the, you know, working for the business stand for. It's customer focused, it's measuring the output, it's aligning our strategy and it's providing value to our partners and not what's on the right side, which tends to be more internal process focused, you know, uh, you have a hammer and every problem is a nail, right? And in terms of the partnering mindset, well, you're working with, you're involved early on, you, you know, you're, you're perceived as equals, you each have a role to play, and those roles are complementary in terms of the objectives that you're delivering on, right? As opposed to coming in late, doing it quickly, processing requisitions, you know, I'm talking historically here, uh, and, and being, being a distinct function that is parallel to, to the business. So that essentially captures some of the thoughts that, that went into B, and this became our, 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 you know, our checklist to measure if we're on track to achieving it or not. Amazing. Alex, uh, any, anything you wanted to add on this one? No, I think you know, that's uh, pretty much aligned with uh, Sami's points. Yeah, Giuseppe, um, it's very much aligned to what this Sami just explained, right? And in many organizations, we see this move to become more customer centric. And in this case, you need to understand what your customer wants, how the business creates value, what is valuable, what are these customer willing to pay for, right? And one way, the easy way is to go and to connect with those customers and consumers, but also your internal stakeholders become those proxies to those customers and consumers. So to become really a customer centric procurement organization, you need to understand deeply what are their pain points, their challenges, their objectives, what is their hell and what is their heaven? And then how procurement can contribute to moving from that hell to that heaven, right? And this is not an SLA. This is not a service provider. This really requires a strong partnership with the business, a, a deep level of understanding of the function, but also of the person in specific roles, right? That marketeer, that CFO, that chiefs of oper operations, etc. You need to understand their space and their context. And the only way to do that is to become a true business partner. Just as an SLA, an outsource uh, provider, etc. you will hardly get there. So this is why uh, also together with Sami, we have worked in putting together a business partnering plan so we can equip our teams with the right mindset and tools and emotional intelligence to do this, to keep evolving our procurement function within the organization. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, uh, I know that Sammy briefly mentioned in his introduction, but uh, maybe help me understand a bit, our audience understand a bit more. How did you get involved in procurement business partnering? Um, uh, maybe Alex, I'll, I'll take it again, and I'll build on your answer actually, because because you pretty much nailed it with the definition of, uh, of value. Um, I mentioned at the beginning we wanted to look at beyond procurement. So we've got a solid function that's got a lot of attributes. It's well connected, qualified people managing a huge scope. What do you do with this? And essentially, it's brokering between what the customers need and what suppliers can provide. Right. So it's that connector role that we want to optimize. And we wanted to understand, okay, well, we'd like to deliver more value, but what is value? 
uh, and essentially it's it's anything that is required. So we kind of went back to the drawing board a little bit and we applied some of the, it's actually some of the lean concepts, but things like the voice of customer, um, things like the Kano model, simply put, how can you delight people beyond their expectation, right? So you can do more than what is expected. And what came out of this is that, and if you look at the models and if, if people have experience with this, if you ask people what they want, they will give you the obvious easy answer that will not actually reveal anything. So that will only lead to some kind of small tactical improvements. But if you observe them and if you, you, know, you put things together that may not be so obvious, you can actually come up with some interesting insights. And that for me was the angle of business partnering. If you're a procurement service provider who works with you know, stakeholders to deliver on their needs, you're asking them what they want, you ship it, you do it well, you do it faster, you save some money, you move on to the next one. But if you're a business partner, you're sitting in with them, you're listening, you're absorbing the insights, you're, you're, you're getting things that may not be relevant for the immediate needs, but you're still connecting those afterwards. And you're coming up with new ideas. You're also bringing things in that may not be directly involved with your role. So when you're moving on to a business partner, you're really wearing two hats in parallel, the business leader and the procurement leader, and you sort of alternate between them, but it's not purely a procurement role where you're doing the things that are in your job description. And that's the foundation of how we got involved to say, let's, let's legitimize and let's create a process for people that aspire to reach that level, that they have a tools and a process to follow to get there. And that became the program essentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, by the way, there is one topic that uh, uh, may be probably one of the questions that the people in our audience are asking themselves. I mean, is this business partner role on top of the job that you have as a category manager, for instance? I mean, how do you tend to organize uh, the role of business partnering in the uh, traditional uh, procurement organizations? And Sami, if you, if I may, I, I want to, to jump in the pool, right? And start this party. Um, I mean, I think for procurement, we need to have the right mindset, but not everybody needs to be that business partner that will sit in every meeting with the business, right? Um, but people need to come with the right mindset to the conversation and also to be able to connect with suppliers. So this is very very important that we are mindful on where and how we're developing this capability. I started to see a trend where some businesses are picking specific categories or spend, etc., and moving this into the business, into the business group, into the business unit, while keeping the leverage, the centralization in others. So for those categories that are strategic to the business in terms of innovation, business continuity, risk management, I think those people absolutely need to become business partners in other parts of the business. And if I may be provocative, this is about leverage. This is about synergies and probably it's about outsourcing. So you may not need everybody, but I think that having the right mindset in the organization will not harm anyone. On the contrary, we will help them to connect better with the business and understand the strategy and create more value in the long run. Sami, what do you think? Yeah, no, I, th I think it's. I think you're spot on again, Alex. The 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 one thing is maybe I'll, I'll add a small anecdote from a personal experience. But um, if you're a business partner to a senior executive, the senior executives that you're working with tend to want to have you focused, and uh, they usually don't appreciate so much a lack of focus. And this one, I'm talking specifically to to events that happened. So if you're sitting in the leadership team, you're part of the leadership team meetings, you're part of the, you know, the, you travel together, you sit, you listen, you're accountable for the overall results, not just your procurement results. It's very hard to do this if you're split or if you're assigned to more than one leadership team. So my straightforward advice building on what Alex said, Giuseppe, is that I think for the top role, you need to be dedicated business partner that is a distinct role from anything. Yeah, there's the notion of depth and there's the notion of breadth. If you're a category manager, you manage a specific category or across a range of businesses. If you're a business partner, you focus on one business, but you're accountable and can interpret and interface for the you know a wide range of categories. So to become that interface, it's not a matter of you know I'll do it half the time and the other half I'll do something else. It's honestly it's it's one big hat that you have to wear tight, uh, and without this, you will not be accepted as such. You can call yourself. But I believe if you're not dedicated at the leadership level, you're still a service provider who's sitting in occasionally on leadership team meetings. 
Okay, perfect. Now, uh, there is a first question. And by the way, this is your LinkedIn life. So, you know, we very much welcome your question. We want to make sure that this is relevant for all of you. So do feel free to ask a question and we'll be happy to address them. So let's start with Rui's question. I think you've highlighted the strategy alignment as a strong anchor. Often procurement work with supplier for many years and it's very value for money driven versus value for stakeholders. Work is lean, the diligence is done, it's often recurring supply of business demand with a preselected pool of supplier. Procurement function is often one of the very difficult ones to bring change. Okay, it's more of a comment than a question. And uh, I don't know if you want to comment uh, on... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take a step as if you allow me, because it's it has the foundation of a question actually, or, or, or uh, you know, not challenging, but at least building on this. So there's customer needs and there's supplier offering, right? And we're kind of going through the flow and drawing from that pool of suppliers they're offering that could be useful to our stakeholders and our customers. Um, in my opinion, and the way the process is designed, it actually starts with the customer needs and it starts with the business strategy. I'll, I'll try to be specific here. Um, when, you know, if procurement is going to work with stakeholders, it needs to have a, an understanding of the business strategy that is equally as good as the stakeholders do. So what does the business actually want and what does it need to get there? And that usually breaks it down into a couple of elements that every company has. There's a growth target. There's a, you know, cost management target. There's a sustainability target, digital, whatever else, innovation. Now, for each of those, there's a stated need and there's probably some unmet needs behind them. That's the sweet spot. That's the part that we're going in and trying to uncover what those are and understanding how procurement can contribute to those stated needs by working with the stakeholders, but also how we go to our suppliers and identify those unmet needs and then ask them to provide thoughts, ideas, whatever can come out of them to try to help us address them, right? So bottom line, it's, you know, try to identify an unmet need or a problem that either the business or stakeholders have, and then go to that with your suppliers to bring in solutions. That's how you will get the initial traction and acceptance. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, let's continue you know, to, to help uh, our audience understand more uh, on, uh, on how to do this in practice. I mean, uh, what do you see as the key steps to put in place an effective procurement business partnering program. May I, Sami? Go ahead, Alex. So, as Sami just described now, you need to understand the business strategy. Who's that customer? How value is created? Who's creating this value? Who's paying for that? Where value is created? All of these, what are the unmet needs of the business? And in many cases, you have different business units, you have regions, you have different trends playing at the same time. So you really need to understand that space. This, the second component will be connect and understand your stakeholders. As I said, what are the pain points? Where is their hell? What's their heaven? How you can contribute? And my invitation really is don't sell any procurement stuff. Just go ask questions, listen, understand, be really curious. And this is where you need to be uh, use your best active listening, coaching skills, connecting, engagement, networking, etc. And the third one, big component is you need to have the right team in place. You need to have the right profiles with, the, with you in your organization in the right seat, and you need to boost team engagement. A team that is engaged will easily engage with customers with suppliers and with the stakeholders and will bring these and build these bridges to connect with the with the business a team that is disengaged we have several difficulties to reach out and to connect with the stakeholders so you also need to have a, a highly engaged team and and there are different tactics for that right but for me the way that we're doing this and the way it has worked is a strategy first connect with the stakeholders and understand the space and you need to have the right team in place Mm -hmm. uh, if I may, Alex, uh, in order to make it happen in your organization, 
did you go for uh, an headcount increase? Did you just change the organization, reduce the number of people that were doing other kind of stuff to free up resources for the business partnering? Or what other kind of setup from a very practical point of view did you put in place uh, to make it happen? Of course, so what we did, as I said, first we checked the strategy. What is needed? Where are we heading? Right? What is this? upcoming future and what will be necessary from procurement standpoint together. Then we did an inventory of what we have in-house, either skills, capabilities, knowledge, for example, digital savings is something we had to start to develop and start working on that, maybe sustainability skills, etc. And then who are the best fit to take the lead on this or to take the lead on that? And in some cases, we will have to adjust. In other cases, we have also a process of continuous improvement where we streamlined our processes, procedures, more automation, more going into digital solutions so we can free up resources to really focus on the business partnering. So my invitation would be assess what do you have and what would you need? There's no one fit all, but for me, the key component, as I said, and I'm sorry if I'm repetitive here, is you need to have the, the best talent on board. You need to put them in the right seat and make sure they're highly engaged, that they understand why they're doing what they're doing and how they're going to do it and how we're going to interact and support the business and they will become the ambassadors with the suppliers right to convey this message and what is needed for the organization fantastic uh, by the way you know one of the things that uh, is often a challenge you know inside procurement organization is that okay you are appointed business partner and your counterpart is uh, three levels above you in, uh, in the company organization, right? You know, maybe you are uh, an associate director, they are a senior vice president or whatever. So how can a junior procurement professional effectively influence executives that are much more senior in the organization? Yeah. Alex, should I take a, <laughs> take yeah, a step? <laughs> Build on by all means. Um, there's a... Um, well, let me take a step back, okay? If you're sitting in with someone who's more senior, and I think the right combination, the right level is usually two levels below. So typically a procurement leader will be sitting in a leadership team of the business that he's working with uh, that is typically two levels higher in the organization. And the peer sitting there would be one level higher. Uh, and that's that's the right level actually uh, from, from the function. Um, but if someone, you know, your question is if you're someone who's more junior, but that probably applies to beyond that. Um, sounds basic, but just listen. Uh, <laughs> listen first. Uh, there's a, For those that are familiar with the Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of, uh, of Highly uh, Successful People, um, there's habit number five that is essentially seek first to understand, then be understood. Um, the worst you can do is coming into a stakeholder's office or meeting and, you know, start opening up with your plan to help them. Uh, you know, listening is a big part. You know, there, there, there's a saying, diagnose before you prescribe. So listen, listen, and listen more. Um, there's a way to listen passively. There's a way to listen actively. But the worst question you can ask anyone, especially if you're new into a business partner role, is how can procurement help you? That is the wrong question. The first question you should ask them, by all means, is what are your top focus? What are, what are your priorities right now? Uh, and understanding where their mind is. The second question is probably something around what are your top three challenges and opportunities to understand, you know, in addition to the priorities, what else they're working on, what else is on their radar. And then you've got an idea of where their mind is. Then you can reconcile this with your plan, your knowledge, your category spend analysis, whatever's going on, and try to target the direction of, okay, well, where can we collaborate, right? That, that's probably a better setup. Uh, and I can't insist enough on this, once you've understood their needs, okay? Now, before you understand their needs, before you make it at that table, you probably have to demonstrate something else up front, which is an understanding of the company priorities that Alex was referring to, right? We've got the five-year plan. We've got the annual targets. We are targeting 10% growth overall. We want a margin protection to improve the margins by five points. Uh, we want to become in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index top 20 this year. And we want to digitalize half of our operations. I'm being silly with those examples. Yeah, yeah. But at least, it, you know, it places that you've done your homework, you know where the company is going. And now how do I work with you to get you and us to where, you know, the company needs us to go? And then the dialogue can actually start.
And honestly, the level of positioning is not that meaningful. I think this applies for everyone. Okay, perfect, fantastic. Uh, we do have a question from our audience. Let's take uh, Gabor's question. How do you deal with a situation as a procurement business partner when a local business need or local category need is going against the standardized streamlined procurement process, which are in place for the entire company? Alex, should I take a, give the generic answer and then you you build up maybe what it was? Yes, please, go ahead, Yeah. Okay. Uh, Gabor, the, the, the answer to this one, I mean, and it's it's a broader one as well, um, I think we're, we're changing a lot overall, not just the function of the companies, but the environment. And that usually requires more flexibility. When you have flexibility, it's better to have principles than to have, you know, policies and procedures. So having some principles that you align inside the organization to know how to respond to this is actually very important. I'll give you one specific case that's from my own experience that addresses this one. One of my principles is that if there's a global deal that essentially offers better or equal advantages to what the current deals are locally, then we ask you to go along with them. If that global deal is detrimental or goes against what you're trying to do locally, please raise the flag and let us not make it negative before you proceed. Okay, so let us make you whole before we ask you to do something that is to your disadvantage. And that usually got us out of the hole. So my simple advice is establish principles, make sure the principles support that deployment, but also when you are going to solve the problem, such as the one that you raised, make sure that you highlight the principles so that it becomes acknowledged and accepted. And then actually it gets you the credibility uh, also with the, the stakeholders that you're working with. Um, Alex, do you want to add something or, or do you agree with sure, what I said? Sure, Sammy. Thank you. And thank you, Gabor, for joining us today. Uh, thank you for your question. I could become really, really curious and try to understand what, why the standard process doesn't work in this context, right? And we just implemented a big system and in Brazil. And Brazil is completely out of the ball game in terms of taxes and regulation, etc. So, yeah, indeed, sometimes we need to adjust what is standardized that may work for 95% of the setup for specific reasons in a country because regulation, taxes, legal, whatever, right? So I my suggestion to, go, to you would be become really, really curious what is going on here. Is there value created for that customer or is just to please a process or a procedure? So where is, and in what context this modification could make sense um, before challenging, right? And trying to force something that might not be a, a good fit. That would be my invitation. This is what I would do. Fantastic, thank you. By the way, uh, just for a second, I want to also give inform uh, our audience that we do have a series of uh, LinkedIn Live event. And uh, the next one that you were probably already put in your calendar is about strategic negotiation with Oxford professor Owen Derbyshire. Uh, Owen is the academic director of the Oxford program on negotiation. So don't miss this opportunity. If you're interested in negotiation, if you are a procurement professional, for instance, then you have on the chat the link. You can sign up right away so that uh, you can benefit from some insight from Owen and myself around strategic negotiation. Owen and I will also be running a master on strategic negotiation on the 27th and 28th of June. Let's go back to the topic of today, right? Procurement business part. Okay, the person that is doing the business partnering, how can they work effectively with their counterpart? But what advice would you Uh, you know, from, from your experience, from what you, you have made up in, uh, at DSM, you know, what will be the advice for uh, the senior executive that want to do it? Yeah, thank you, Giuseppe. So 
Seems very basic, but the stra start with the business strategy. Um, I cannot repeat enough times to start understanding the business strategy. Don't go and put together a plan that is not connected at all with the business the expectations, the challenges, etc. just for the pleasure of doing procurement. So that for me would be the first step and it's one of the most common pitfalls. The second one is really become close and develop your internal network uh, with the stakeholders, but also externally. Understand what is the role of those suppliers, what the, what the role of the company in the industry, what are the key trends, etc. So this would be the second one. And the third one, again, is make sure that you have the right team and invest heavily in building capabilities like emotional intelligence, active listening, maybe coaching and getting your leaders trained as a coaches, right? So they can really use these questions, open-ended questions. If you go to a senior and say, how many million or how much many millions you want on savings, they will give you a number. But understand why they want these savings. What's the purpose of these savings? What's the impact in the PNL, right? What this means for them. So equip your team to be able to do that and you need to monitor progress. And this is very, very important. And you will start seeing how the relationships, the projects, the initiative, the lighthouse processes that you may launch start moving faster in a better direction. There's more value created and the team engagement also usually uh, increases. Anything to add, Sami? Alex, you're, you're doing this quite, uh, <laughs> I think you've covered everything. Just, I'm thinking, Giuseppe, maybe the visual can help. Uh, yeah, you know, I was also thinking the same, with... you know, because I, I do have the, the program that you, you put in place, and that's uh, maybe probably easy to explain this, right? I mean, I, I think so. It probably gives a reference to what Alex described in, in actually very nice details. But, you know, we've got the three components, right? And th this, by the way, is the overview of the capability building program. It's irrelevant, it, essentially, how it's developed. It's, it's more of the content that is interesting. Uh, but the first one is around the strategy alignment. The second module is around the stakeholder engagement. The third is around the people. And if you look at the building blocks for each one of them, the sequence actually captures most of what was shared before. So the procurement team needs to have at least a basic understanding of the strategic planning fundamentals because this is how companies operate. What's the five-year strategy? What is it we want to get done? What's the operating plan to get there? What's the budget gaps that, you know, that come out of it, right? And in terms of the, the quarterly uh, sequence. Then out of that, we extract the imperatives. What are the priorities that the company has? And we finish with essentially what or how can procurement contribute to those established priorities, the example that I gave before. Once we have these business needs and the business strategy, then we can move on to the stakeholders. And to the stakeholders, we start by informing them, okay, uh, here's my understanding of where, you know, where the business needs are. But before we start talking, they usually have preset expectations of what procurement can do. And we usually have a different aspirations of how we'd like to work with them. Um, go back to my, my, my point. If you ask them what do you need from procurement, you will get the simple predictable answer that you don't want to hear. So help elevate this, this discussion, right? So to do this, what we do is we do a whole stakeholder mapping and engagement plan, understand who essentially is inclined to support the procurement strategy that we've established before, and go to them early on in the process. And to do so, again, referring back to what Alex was mentioning, uh, we will do make sure that we've got a clear positioning and branding, both for the functions, but also for the individuals. Uh, you cannot come at this with the wrong, you know, from the wrong angle with the wrong message, you will simply be rejected. So you need to work your way into that role, even if it's assigned to you, uh, before you can operate. And the reality is, my own experience, Alex, please disagree. You usually start acting like a business partner be before your role of one is formalized. Uh, you don't get knighted with the sword on each side and saying, congratulations, today you're a business partner. You work your way up to that. And at the beginning, it's usually tolerated. I mean, okay, I, I can deal with it if you don't bother me. Then it becomes accepted. It's like you're, you're part of the, you know, you're part of the furniture now. And the third one, it becomes expected. I mean, they're expecting your contribution to help them with, the, with their process. You've got a role to play. That's usually how the success is measured, okay? And then moving on to the people development, um, this thinking like an entrepreneur is really the fundamental. An entrepreneur knows what he brings. 
identifies a problem that can be solved and matches those two together. And this is how in procurement you repeat over and over with your business partner. Okay. The second one is each person has strengths. Either the team self forms or the leader needs to assemble fit for purpose teams, depending on what the issue is. And the third one is actually something that's getting a resurgence, but it's the whole topic of emotional intelligence. Um, if you're looking at engagement, you're talking relationships. If you're talking relationships, you're down to emotional or emotions management. That is usually not a strength of procurement professionals. And I'm saying this very respectfully. Uh, it's easy to understand. Honestly, it's hard to apply. The awareness of yourself, how you express yourself, the awareness of others, and how you collaborate with them. And that's a skill that we're working on more and more to make sure that people can engage very efficiently and naturally. So that kind of wraps up the the, the, the three module approach. Uh, and that's the very complete answer to your question, Joseph. Very I'm comprehensive sorry. indeed. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Alex, go keep Let going. Let me yeah. add something because uh, Sammy, really at the end, but not because it's the least important, the emotional intelligence component. And we have seen in procurement and supply chain through this pandemic, lockdowns, uncertainty, everything, how when procurement has been successful in connecting with others is when we use our emotional intelligence, when we recognize our stakeholders are anxious, they don't know what's going on, they have a lot of pressure, etc. So when the way to connect with them has been through emotional intelligence, and this has proved that actually work, especially when people are under immense stress as we have lived these three years. But it's not only for our internal customers, it's also with our suppliers, right? A lot of suppliers having force majeures and shutdowns and lack of capability and labor shortages. They're also under a lot of stress. And then procurement becomes this emotions manager somehow trying to connect these different stakeholders and find a way to build these bridges that will create more value. So I think we have recent experience of how the emotional intelligence actually is a differentiation on how procurement can create more value through having these strong connections with the people within different organizations, develop the network and sustain the ecosystem. Fantastic. Alex, I have a question. As you try to implement you know, those different building blocks within your organization, which is the one where you had more of a challenge? Which is the one where you were confronted with resistance or we ended up, you know, maybe delaying your, your implementation because something was not quite there? I could say the, the second component, the part of the stakeholders. And the point is procurement within the organization used to be heavily transactional, operational, pushing paper. And for many stakeholders, that was perfectly fine. They had no need or no other expectation that just get my material cheap and right on time. Thank you very much. You can go home, right? So coming with a value proposition that is different took time. And to Sammy's point, we had to identify some quick wins. And the only way to do that is to understand what are those pain points or missed opportunities the business was facing in terms of service, quality, regulation, innovation, sustainability, and bringing examples of how this close collaboration can actually unlock that potential and unlock the potential from our suppliers. So my recommendation from this experience is really start small, run some pilots, find what are those stakeholders that have are more open to, to this kind of programs that may have a lot of needs or net needs, or where they're facing a challenge like a market, a, a brand, a product line or something, and start by there by working with them and this will create the appetite of others and one day you may find yourself that you don't have enough capacity to deal with all these requirements so that's good right because then it proves that you have become this trusted business partner to the exactly. organization exactly so your message really alex is uh, don't say okay as of the 1st of April, I'm going to put a procurement business partner. I will appoint eight person to do it, etc. It's more like, you know, a gradual process. You start little by little, you choose the, the stakeholder which are more open. You put your best people in those role so that the experiment succeed and you create the right bonding. You start changing the image of procurement and then this grows uh, as a, a snowball inside the organization. Is that uh, a fair representation of what uh, you have experienced? Exactly, Giuseppe. And I think as the leader in the organization, you need to have an active role 
into creating also this connection point with the broader network. You cannot just appoint someone and say, go swim, right? And if you either you drone or you go to the other side <laughs> with the business, you need to be, to be engaged, coach the team, mentor, sometimes facilitate connection, et cetera. But you need to create this space and this net where the people can start working on this because sometimes they will struggle and there will be stakeholders that they don't want to work with them. And then this is where you need to be much more intentional in the coaching, the mentoring, the capability, and maybe having a crucial conversation with other stakeholder. And this also requires a certain level of visibility and leadership in the organization. So everything you said is right, except that you cannot just throw people in the pool and expect that they will swim uh, this uh, marathon. You need to be there with them all the time. Fantastic. Perfect, Alex. Now we are towards the end of our uh, event. You know, let me be closer with uh, a practical question with people that they may not be the leader of the function, but they may be acting, let's say, in a business partner role. So what advice do you have for procurement people that act as a business partner? Um, it, it's um, <laughs> uh, it, it's probably a broad uh, question, Giuseppe. Let, let me break the ice by uh, building on what Alex said, and, and maybe we can lead to something else. Um, when you ask where's the weakest link or where the people struggle with the most, it's the stakeholder management. Okay, uh, I think it's clear uh, that that's the part. Now, my personal assessment in terms of where this breaks down is that people don't try to connect with the individuals behind the role. You're not talking to a product manager. You're not talking to a packaging line operator. You're not talking to a quality director. You're talking to the person behind that role. And all of their needs are not necessarily those that are stated in the job description. Not everybody wants on time, right price, right quality, right? So trying to go a little bit deeper in the understanding and connecting with them is, is a really big thing. And I connect the, you know, the, the block five that we talked about, the mapping and engagement with the emotional intelligence. Um, it, it's not a, it's not a very sophisticated question, but that would be my first advice, honestly, is to grow the emotional intelligence, grow the awareness primarily, read the room, understand the map. It, you know, once you get it, it becomes a lot more visible. You actually do have to fight less battles if you follow the right path. You don't have to push your way in. There's places where you can be pulled in, but you have to read them. It, it will not come to you. You will not get this map given to you. You have to assemble it yourself. Um, again, it, it seems like a bit of a broad uh, answer, but I, I, I truly believe it's the right first step. So first one would be that. The second one is also building on what was said before. Uh, there's usually a chicken and egg question. What do you do first? Do you get the mandate for business partnering and build the operating model, or do you build the capability and get the talents to support that deployment? I think the right answer is you build the capability first, but it comes with a caveat. There's a time frame by which you need to convert the first into the second. If you get people, train them, motivate them, recruit them, and all of the above, and they cannot actually come and do what they're expected to do, they will be demotivated and leave. If you build the organization expectation, but you don't have people to support that, it's also bad because you will fail in delivering on, on what, what you've asked for. So I would probably venture there's, in my opinion, a three to six month window uh, by the time that you start this with you know getting the people, getting the excitement, building the capability, until you can formalize or at least start deploying that in a structured way within the organization so you can get the traction and then grow onto it. Okay, so that would be the, the advice number two. Advice number three would be over time or when we're ready, the focus of the organization, the structure, the operating model of the function needs to switch. You cannot have the categories on top and the process owners on top. The business needs to be on top, just almost like a consulting company. You focus on the business units first, divisions, whatever, you know, whatever the business product leadership is, you support them with what you have in terms of internal capabilities, but this is done and managed through the business partners that sit on top. So it actually is meant to be a very senior role uh, that interfaces with the very top leadership of the business units. Excellent. I mean... That was an amazing discussion. Thank you very much, you know, Alex and Sammy for sharing your wisdom. Now, by the way, if you're interested to understand more about our procurement business partner look from a practitioner point of view, then Alex uh, is probably happy to welcome your LinkedIn invitation. If you have something that uh, you want to have a quick chat with her, if you said, you know, you want to implement it and you need some uh, 
serious help, high quality help to make it happen, then Sami is the person to go to. And uh, on my side, uh, before I thank uh, our uh, guest for today, I remind you that uh, we are going to have uh, more opportunities to connect together. LinkedIn Live Strategic Negotiation with Oxford Professor Owen Darby Shire on the 6th of February. So you have the link on the chat and uh, you can sign up so that we continue our learning journey. Today certainly was a very rich learning journey with Sami and Alex. Thank you very much for being with us today and uh, lots of success uh, for uh, the, uh, the, let's see, the fruits that you're going to get from this business partnering activity that you're putting in place, next level business partnering, working with the business, not for the business. Thanks again. Thank you, Giuseppe. Thanks, Giuseppe. Thank you. All the best. Thank you to our audience and to the people that uh, are watching the recording for being with us uh, today. And uh, hope uh, you found uh, what we got today useful and fruitful to step up your procurement role. Take care. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.